YouTube, hey, what's going on, y'all? Kai here checking in with another video. Hey, today, today we got Swamp Stories back on the channel, as y'all see. We got the Asian Assassins, how they caught 11 bodies in two years and took over Toronto. So, to me, it just sounds like the Asians just ain't playing around. Like, they ain't fucking around. Like, they ain't stepping on everything moving. Let's go on to get into the story right here, though. Welcome back to another episode of Swamp Stories. For this video, we head to Canada. Whoa! Wait, wait, wait. I know no one cares about Canada. I mean, not even Canada cares about Canada. But this video is actually pretty good, so give me a chance. I kid you not, the video will blow your mind. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're welcome. Million red Toronto, Canada, by far the country's largest city with a whopping 2.9 million residents. The beautiful city is one of the safest, cleanest, and wealthiest cities in the world. And for these reasons, immigrants from everywhere have been flocking to Toronto, making it one of the most diverse cities on earth. Many families moved to Toronto with nothing and within one generation have created successful lives. However, sure. this is not as easy as I'm making it seem. In fact, Toronto was one of the most expensive cities in the world with the average one-bedroom apartment costing $2,500 a month. What? So according to calculations, in order to afford a one-bedroom apartment, you must make $90,000 a year. Well, to aid this problem, the city of Toronto provides a large number of public housing. And just like America, public housing can often be neglected in centers for all kinds of illicit activity. For Toronto, no area holds more public housing than the one covered in this video. The story begins in Chinatown, but specifically a neighborhood called Alexandra Park. The area consists of three public housing complexes, historically known for Chinese and Vietnamese residents. For most of its history, the projects were pretty peaceful, so police never had to focus in on Alexandra Park. But little did they know, the projects were a stronghold for the Triads, a worldwide crime organization based in China. The Triads had structure, rules, and strict regulations. They kept everything secretive, and most importantly, they disguised as regular civilians. In order to be a part of the secret society, you had to go through a vetting process and to prove your ultimate loyalty. Maid triad members often lived an abundant lifestyle, but they had to go through a very, very long process. But as you would expect, many low-income teenagers were not willing to wait this long. Many of them just wanted to jump off the porch and get money now. In 2005, a small group of teenagers from Alexandra Park decided to group together and jump off the porch. The crew was led by a young man named Michael Nguyen, and he always had three friends by his side. Why his last name always Nguyen? I remember the one he did, uh, his DMV jump, but it wasn't nowhere in the DMV. That jump was in motherfucking, uh, Manassas and, like, Fairfax and all that shit. Like, that's not the DMV. But they had a Nguyen in that video, too. These would be Terry Nguyen, Kuelev Chong, and Rowan Atkins. Together, the four began getting... Fuck it, names, Terry man. Nguyen, Chinese. Kuelev Chong, and Rowan Atkins. Together, the four began getting money the only way they knew how, running inside people's houses. The teens made this their lifestyle throughout the early 2000s until it all came crashing down in 2005. September 20th, 2005. The group of four teenagers began getting paranoid that Toronto police may be catching on to their ways. So together, they start searching for houses to hit outside of Toronto. At 5 p.m., they decide to make a four-hour drive to the city of Windsor, Canada. They arrive at 9 p.m. and they begin circling around looking for wealthy areas. At 10 p.m., they find a large house in the St. Clair neighborhood, and this house has no cars in the driveway. So together, the four get out of the car and rush to the door. Boom! They kick it down and run in. That's crazy. And this 05, y'all. So 05, we wanted that many, like, surveillance cameras. They might have had some, but not like they got them now. That's great. Inside looking for closets. As they scour through the house, they notice a couple under the sheets in the master bedroom. So they direct them onto the ground to make sure they don't dial 911. Little do they know the couple had already called the police once they heard the bang. Well, as the members fill up their bags, they begin hearing sirens in the distance. So they instantly run down to their car. But right there are five Windsor police officers. Michael, Terry, Q, and Rowan are all instantly arrested and taken to Ontario jail. So they did all that just to... During the... That's why, bro, 
I can't do no criminal because soon as I seen the couple, bro, I'm out of there, bro. What the hell? Suing trial, the courts found out that the four teens were from Alexandra Park, which at the time had no significance. In fact, the judge believed that they were just good kids who fell down the wrong path. So as a result, they were only sentenced to two and a half years in prison. Once this was revealed, the Windsor community was pissed, but the judge decided to stick by his morals. After the sentencing, the judge named Bruce Brown told them this, Where you go from here is up to you, but you need to take this to heart. Well, by 2008, the four men were back in Alexandra Park. And by all accounts, the young men took nothing the judge said to heart. In fact, when they got home, they were worse than ever before. In 2008, Michael Nguyen decided that he wanted to start a gang. He was already a leader amongst his peers and he wanted to take this into his own hands. His goal was to be a feared leader in Toronto, the kind of guy that nobody would mess with. He named his crew the Asian Assassins and he began recruiting from within Alexandra Park. From 2008 to 2011, the Assassins got larger and larger with more and more young men from the projects joining along. But by this time, the Assassins were not the only ones in Alexandra Park. The Project Originals, also known as P.O., had formed their section as well. The Assassins were pretty much the Asian side, and P.O. was pretty much everyone else. Usually, having two sets operating within the same projects can be a problem, but that was not the case. For Alexandra Park, everyone from both sets grew up together, and they were the best of friends. On top of this, the Project Originals were already knee-deep in a vicious rivalry. For years, they had already been going back and forth with a set called the Sick Thugs. These guys are located in Regent Park, another set of projects just 12 minutes away. Well, coincidentally, Regent Park... Man, niggas are real loud be beefing. That's how that shit is in my city. Niggas be beefing with niggas like fucking five minutes away. Like, bro, what the fuck? had the same dynamic as Alexandra. The sick thugs were the mostly non-Asian guys from the projects and their Asian friends had their own set as well. This would be Chin Pak, a group of guys with a similar story and similar motives. For a couple of years, Chin Pak and the Asian assassins tried to stay out of the PO versus sick thugs beef. But with this dynamic, things were eventually going to fall apart. In November of 2011, a Chin Pak member fought a PO member in jail. This was the first crossover incident, and it definitely messed up the entire dynamic. Both Chin Pak and the Asian assassins had vowed to stay out of the PO versus Sick Thugs beef. And this small incident sadly opened the floodgates. Just a few months later, in March of 2012, a Sick Thugs member fought an Assassin's member in Toronto jail. So now what used to be Sick Thugs versus PO was quickly becoming the entire Regent Park versus the entire Alexandra Park. At this point for the Assassins and Chin Pack, it was all jailhouse squabbles and online disses. Because of this and the fact that they had common triad connections, there was still hope to regain a truce. But then Chin Pack decided to kick everything off in the worst way possible. November 11th, 2012. It's a late Saturday night and a group of Assassins members happen to be out partying near the University of Toronto. At 12.45 a.m., Koela Chong leaves the pub and walks across the street to a restaurant. As he's crossing the street, a car full of Chin Pak members rolls by. Once they notice him, they hop out and make a devastating decision. The incident shook everyone up and the neighborhood had never seen anything like this before. But more importantly, Chong was popular and loved by Alexandra Park. The loss infuriated everyone and just like that, the beef was on. The Asian assassins were now out for revenge on Chin Pak. December 31st, 2012. It's your typical New Year's Eve celebration in Toronto. And if you know anything about Toronto, they party like crazy. Well, on this night, Chin Pak are out together at the government nightclub by the water. At 11 p.m., Chin Pak arrives to the club with nothing but partying on their minds. Little do they know the Asian assassins have the same plans for the night. At 1 a.m., they roll into the club, but that's when a member notices Chin Pak in the corner. So instantly, he taps on his fellow member members shoulders and tells them to roll. They instantly leave the club and head to their car across the street. They realize that this is their chance to get revenge, so they wait in their car. 
2.20 a.m. The club begins clearing out, and that's when the assassins get ready. At 2.24, they notice a member named Jerry Fan leaving the club, so that's when they get out of the car and sprint across the street. <laughs> Thankfully, Jerry was okay, but now Chin Pak knew that they needed to watch their backs. From this moment, they began moving low-key and staying about 20 minutes away from Old Toronto. That takes us to February 23rd, 2013. It's another freezing cold Saturday night in Toronto, and that it's means that Chin Pack are out somewhere partying. On this night, they happen to be all the way out in northwest Toronto, 30 minutes away from home. Because they're so far away, the members are partying freely with no rivals on their mind. Little do they know, someone had given the rivals their location for the night. At 1.15 a.m., Chin Pack's Tony Nguyen leaves the club all wrapped up in jackets. As he shivers his way to his car, he notices two men standing right in front of him. And and before he can react, <laughs> after doing this, the two men got in their separate cars and returned to Alexandra Park. The next morning, they returned the rental cars to the airport, which probably wasn't the smartest thing to do. This is because Toronto police had access to surveillance footage with the license plates. So later that same day, the police made a visit to the rental place. They asked them for documents about who rented two Dodge Caravans the day before. Somehow, the rental place told police that they had lost the records of who rented the cars. Hmm, a little suspicious, huh? Either way, the members were able to get away with this for now. After this incident, the Asian assassin's name began ringing around the city of Toronto. Specifically, Michael Nguyen became a feared character as he was the leader of this wild crew. As you would imagine, with this kind of notoriety, he was at the top of the Chin Pak hit list. March 30th, 2013. It's a regular day in the life of Michael Nguyen as he heads to the Yorkdale Mall to spend some money. He walks around, buys a few things, and then heads to his car at 7 p.m. Parked right next to his car is a gray Chevy Malibu full of Chin Pak members. Once he approaches his car, the men hop out and bam! The loss of Michael Nguyen brought major attention from the community. Since his childhood years, he had been one of the most popular- Oh, the leader! That's crazy! guys in old Toronto. Well, the men who did this covered their tracks well as police were not able to get any leads. However, during their brief investigations, they found out about the Asian assassins. So two days later, they held a press conference where they assured the public that the Asian assassins are not a problem. They then stated that they're not even on the police's top 10 radar. Boy, were they wrong, as this was just the start of a wild, wild journey. Well, first, we have to discuss what happened after they lost their leader. After a long meeting, the Assassin's members elected Michael's cousin named Peter Nguyen to be the new leader. Peter was fierce and had the largest motive to get revenge on Shin Pak. For him, the situation was deep and he was going to make sure to get revenge. May 11th, 2013. It's a Saturday afternoon in Toronto and the Shin Pak leader is eating lunch at the Yorkdale Mall. This would be Kevin Pham, pretty much the equal of Peter Nguyen for Chin Pak. Somehow, assassin members get word that Kevin is eating at Joey's restaurant in the mall. So instantly, two members hop in their car and drive to the mall. Once they get there, one of the members double parks out front while the other runs inside the mall. He walks right into Joey's restaurant and looks for Kevin Pham. Once he spots him, he walks right over to his table. Thankfully, the member pulled a Ben Simmons and Kevin Pham ended up being okay. Regardless, Kevin would never forget this incident, but his revenge would not come yet. In fact, the summer and fall of 2013 were very peaceful, which brought hope to the community. But then came the winter, when everything heated up. December 6, 2013. It's a freezing winter day and Assassin's member Michael Kwan is pumping gas on Lakeshore Boulevard. While he's at the pump, a blue Subaru full of Chin Pak members pulls beside him. And before he can turn around, bang. Thankfully, Michael was okay, but this definitely woke up the Assassins. The beef was back on, and that takes us to Christmas Day 2013. It's early Christmas morning, and a Chin Pak member named Dai Nguyen is in his driveway putting presents in his trunk. His plan is to surprise his family on this joyous day. Well, little does he know, an Asian Assassin's member is parked across the street. So at 8.30 a.m., the member hops out of his car and runs up to the driveway. 
Dai Nguyen was hit 14 times, but thankfully he was rushed to the hospital where they saved Damn. his life. And thanks to doorbell cameras, an Asian Assassin's member named Jamie Dang was arrested two days later. For Dai Nguyen, the situation understandably shook him up. So to ensure his safety, he moved to the city of Vancouver, all the way on the western edge of Canada. He knew the rivals were after him, so he hoped that this was far enough to get away from them. Was this enough? Well, I guess you have to wait to see. In the meantime, we focus back on the Chin Pack leader, Kevin Pham. After the incident at Joey's restaurant, Kevin Pham was as angry as a human could be. After recovering, he vowed to get revenge on any rival member he could find. So for the first week of January, he scoured through the city of Toronto looking for rivals. After days of finding no one, he came up with a better plan. He really wanted to target an assassin's member named Premier Wong, also known as Primo. Primo was just 18 years old, but already a certified legend in Toronto. It's rumored that since the age of 16, Primo had been making $50,000 a month in the streets. The money gave him elevated status, to the point where P.O. rappers Rolex, Hami, and Houdini would often shout him out. But as you would expect, this also made him a major target for the rival side. Primo knew this was the case, so he moved out of the projects to a suburb called Richmond Hill. Here is where he focused on stacking money and staying out of the way. Kevin Pham realized that finding him in Richmond Hill was an impossible task, so instead he contacted a man that he figured could help him out. This would be a sleazy Richmond Hill native named Timothy Lee. Timothy Lee was a street level distributor just like Primo. So after getting in touch with Timothy, Kevin convinced him to set Primo up. So Timothy would contact Primo and set up a time to make a deal. January 8th, 2014. It's a freezing cold night in Richmond Hill. Primo is sitting in his red Lexus LS waiting for Timothy to pull up. Because this is business as usual, Primo is sitting in the car with his girlfriend Brenda and her brother Brandy. At 8pm, Primo sends his location to Timothy. So here come Timothy Lee and Kevin Pham. At 8.45, they arrive in a black Honda and pull beside them. They then lower their window and BAM! That's crazy. This was a shocking incident to the suburbs of Richmond Hill, but more importantly, Primo was the man in Toronto, I can't stress this enough. After his passing, all kinds of songs would reference his name. In fact, a Sick Thugs rapper would reference him by saying two in him and one in his girl. For many, this was the most important man in Alexandra Park, but Chin Pack were not satisfied. They had another important rival in mind. Now that Primo was gone, Chin Pack wanted the leader Peter Nguyen. February 4th, 2014. It's a Tuesday evening and Peter Nguyen is eating dinner at a restaurant in North Toronto. After finishing his sushi, Peter gets up and walks across the street to his car. But right there is Kevin Pham's older brother named Fan Pham. And without hesitation, bang. After a chase, Than Pham was arrested by police and taken to jail. This was the second leader that the Asian assassins had lost at the hands of Chin Pak. Regardless, crazy. Chin Pak was crazy. not done sending their message. Just five days later, they would strike again. February 10th, 2014. It's a freezing cold night in the West Toronto suburbs and an assassin's member named Hung Pham is driving home. At 10.30 p.m., he arrives in his neighborhood just a block down from his house. As he drives slowly through the snow, a car pulls right beside him. And without hesitation, bang! At this point, the assassins were being obliterated and they didn't know what to do. Without their leaders, they lacked Stop unison stepping. and didn't have anyone to tell them what that's what that shit sound like. Hey, y'all getting your ass. They putting both their ass, bro. They spanking shit. Like, what y'all, what you mean? That they don't know what to do, bro. Nigga better sit on that rip. Nigga better sit on that motherfucking rip. What the hell? What to do. But finally, six weeks later, the members would get a hold of a rival's address. This would be the address of a Chin Pack member named Tan No. Tan No had become the most feared Chin Pack member as rumors hit the streets that he was behind a lot of the incidents. Well, once the Asian assassins got his address, they decided to make a bold move. March 25th, 2014, 5 30 p.m. The assassins' members arrive at No's house on Symington yeah, Avenue. Pulled up One member house. stays in the car while the other walks up to the door. 
boldly knocks on the front door expecting Tan No to respond. But instead, an older man opens up who he was not expecting to see. Regardless, the member still makes his wild move. Man, what the fuck? Man, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, bro. Man, what the fuck type with You gonna kill an old man, bro? He don't know what's going on with... That could be his son, grandson. Like, he don't know what's going on. That's not making no mark. It's not leaving no mark. You doing something to somebody that ain't got nothing to do with nothing. Niggas is lame. Police arrived in 10 minutes and identified the man as 64-year-old Knock No, the father of Tan No. When Tan heard about the news, he was crushed, and so was the entire community. Incidents like this are very rare in Canada, so police began serious investigations. Once they discovered the family's connections to Chin Pak, they knew what this was all about. They didn't yet have proof, but they knew that the Asian assassins were behind this. Even though just a year prior they said that they weren't a problem, they now realized their mistake and they were going to make up for it. Over the next few months, police would go extra hard in their investigations. Police began monitoring every Chin Pak and Asian Assassin's member. They even tapped their phones to get insider information. After weeks of tracking, investigators could not find a single thing. So instead, they decided to pull out a very controversial tactic. In Canada, this is known as Mr. Big. The idea is for undercover cops to befriend whoever they're investigating. From there, they engage in a business relationship where trust is built. From there, the hope is that the target will give up all kinds of insider information. Well, the only problem is that police knew that Chin Pak and the assassins were way too smart to fall for this. So instead, they had their eyes set on a particular target. This would be good old Timothy Lee from Richmond Hill. They knew he wasn't a Chin Pak member, but they also knew that he had some very valuable information. Well, after tapping his calls, police discovered conversations between him and his girlfriend discussing designer clothing. From there, they learned that his girlfriend worked at Michael Kors and loved fashion. So what they did with this was pretty interesting. They decided to send a female undercover cop to Michael Kors during his girlfriend's shift. Long story short, the undercover cop walks in and begins talking talking to Timothy's girlfriend about clothes and whatever the else. Girlfriend. The undercover cop then pretends to be so impressed that she offers her a job. From there, the police gave her a fake job as an international concierge. They actually set her up in an office and had her meeting with fake clients. You may be thinking, why are they doing this? But just hold on. After weeks of leading this on, they finally invite her and Timothy to dinner. The male undercover cops befriend Timothy and actually take him to a Raptors game. After building this relationship, they reveal to Tony that they're a mafia. But first, they explain to him that they need to gain his trust before they elaborate. This is a trick of reverse psychology that they hope pays off in the end. Well, after Timothy proved his trust, they officially inducted him into the Mafia. They even paid Timothy a large monthly salary. He figured that his old life was in the past and now he was living good. But the whole time, these so-called friends and bosses were Man, they got motherfucking Gunner and Rick Ross trying to get information so a few weeks in they began asking and they keep throwing his pitch up there he must be a rat him questions about his previous life it took a while but he actually began opening up they used the fact that they opened up to him about their mafia as leverage to get him to open up about his past On sweet top ass of this nigga's a sweet bitch that's why bro you want to be befriending random niggas you don't even know off your girlfriend's accord like, come on, bruh. I just would have told niggas small shit, shit they want to hear. <laughs> yeah, bro. I heard I heard you was out in the street stepping. Nah, I don't know what you heard, but that ain't me, bro. I'm just a square from Delaware. Yes, they even bought him a Rolex watch to speed things up. That was as a fake Roly. Eventually, Timothy Lee gave up everything. And I mean, everything. <laughs> Timothy told the undercover cops everything about the Asian assassins and Chin Pak. He also told them that he and Kevin Pham were the ones responsible for the loss of Primo and his girlfriend. All of this led to one of the biggest takedowns in Canadian history, May 29th, 2014. 
Operation Battery. In one day, 53 raids took place in Toronto, That's resulting in tough. 94 arrests. That's Timothy was tough. taken into custody by the same men who just bought him a Rolex. While the large takedowns pretty much wiped out 80% of everyone involved, and it actually brought peace to the city of Toronto. This gave police and the entire community hope that the rivalry had finally come to an end. But the assassins' members who were left over still had vengeance on their mind. All they needed was for the attention to pass over. Well, that time would eventually come, and the Asian assassins had three leftover Chin Pack members in mind. First would be Jerry Fan, the man who survived the New Year's Eve 2012 incident. After the incident, Jerry Fan smartly moved to the suburbs of Richmond Hill. Because of this, he stayed out of the indictments, and his life was drama free. Next would be Dai Nguyen, the man who survived the Christmas morning incident. After the incident, Dai moved all the way to the city of Vancouver to restart a new happy life. And lastly, you have Tan No. After losing his father, Tan was furious, but he decided to lay low to duck the indictments. Because of all this, everything was peaceful and remained at a standstill. But then the Asian assassins decided to break the ice. November 3rd, 2014. It's a Monday evening and Jerry Fan is eating dinner at the keg in Richmond Hill. There, he enjoys a meal with his friends and walks to his car at 7.15. When he gets to his car, he notices a man in a ski mask and gloves standing right in front of him. And before Jerry can react, bang. This was the first step in the assassin's revenge and the member was able to get away with this. Well, after doing this, they still weren't satisfied. Next in line would be Dai Nguyen. This one would be more complicated as Dai was located all the way in Vancouver. And for those who are unfamiliar, the fastest way to get there is down to Chicago in 40 hours across Interstate 94. And the yeah, they're going for all shit. I was just thinking that like when he said Vancouver, that's on the whole, you know, like, that's down on the West Coast. You see where it's at? It's Seattle. Toronto, Canada's big as shit if y'all don't know. Like, it's real lot bigger shit. So Toronto is New York, if y'all don't know. If I see on this map right here. So Toronto, New York, bam. Okay, cool. Washington, Seattle, Washington, right there. Then you go up, then you got Vancouver. That's just how that shit set up. So that jump on the whole other side. So when he said that at the beginning, he was like, yeah, they was in Toronto, but Shawty moved to Vancouver. Like, that's on a whole other side. Like, he was always ducked off. That nigga went all the way to the whole other side. The drive avoiding crossing the border is 52 hours long. Long story short, this would not be an easy task. Nonetheless, for the Asian assassins, nothing was out of reach. September 27th, 2015. Here we are in the beautiful, quiet city of Vancouver, Canada. 2 p.m. It's a day in the new life of Dai Nguyen as he goes to a strip mall to run some errands. He goes about his business as usual and walks to his car. But right there is a man covered head to toe. And before Dai can react, bang. How the fuck they know this where to find him? This was the neighborhood's man. first incident since 2010 and everyone was rattled. As you would expect, police in Vancouver did everything they could to track down a suspect. But whoever did it covered his tracks very well. This now meant that there was only one Chin Pack member left on the streets. This of course would be the infamous leader Tan No. Tan was able to successfully lay low for a few years. And after three years of hiding, he figured it was safe to pop back out in Toronto. March 17th, 2018. It's a Saturday night in Toronto and Tan decides to pop out with some old friends and go bowling. So he and his friends drive to the bowling alley, park their car and begin to walk in. As they approach the door, they notice a man sprinting behind them. But by the time Tan turns around, it's far too late. Damn, they really got all three of the niggas that they said that they wanted. This was the saddest incident of them all as Ruma Umar had nothing to do with this. Amar and her husband marked their one-year anniversary two weeks ago. They had gone out that night with her little sister, Rima. Those who loved her most want her remembered for her strength, kindness, and dedication to her job. In fact, only a week ago, she had received a promotion at CIBC. 
Thankfully, though, this would be the end of Chin Pak and the Asian Assassins. 94 members were serving time from Operation Battery and no one else was left on the streets. In just a few years, two entire neighborhoods essentially wiped each other out. And the craziest part is that this rivalry is actually smaller than the PO versus Sick Thugs. Either way, this was a terrible situation. And what, whatever happened to them? Damage and destruction. But thanks to. So the Asian side of the gangs get wiped out, but what happened to. The P.O.'s and the sick, uh, come on, bro. For hardworking Toronto police, the rivalry is finally over. This is another reminder that just because people live across an imaginary line does not mean it's all the way safe. In fact, Toronto goons are nothing to mess with. And on that note, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And if you did, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Peace. Hey, see y'all niggas in the next video, though. Peace myself.